Shall I start? I don't know who the... Okie doke. Here, we'll wait for this group. Excellent. All right. I'm going to be talking now in my second lecture about substitutability conditions and further generalizations of generalized matching. Uh, this is an incredible honor for me, just as my first lecture was. And in this case, because you know, matching with contracts and its extensions and generalizations has been incredibly central to my own work specifically. You know, when I first saw the matching with contracts paper, and this was in uh, in Al's class uh, years ago, we saw Kelso and Crawford and matching with and Hatfield Milgram matching with contracts, and it was like. You know, one of these situations you hear of or imagine in a gold rush where like you sort of you people were like throwing stones against nearby rocks and this crust would fall off and there'd be this huge vein of gold. Um, it was just amazing because it organized all of the structure for me in a way that I hadn't had before. And you know, and, and for that it you know it made it possible to see sort of where all the other matchings were in, in, in a very broad way. And so before I even start the lecture, I'm going to talk for a second just about the way I think about matching and why I care about all of this structure. So to me, you know, it's very useful to have a map of all of the sort of trade-offs between assumptions and where the boundaries of the different pieces of structure are. Because when I see a real-world problem, something that looks kind of like a matching market, I can sort of look at my structure map and sort of project down exactly what I expect to work and what, not, what won't work. And I've actually used this in the search for real-world applications of generalized matching. I'll talk at the very end. Now, this is mostly going to be a theory talk, but I'll talk at the very end about places where this sorts, these sorts of models have been applied. And it turns out that having a really, really strong and coherent map can help you find applications that you otherwise might not have thought made any sense, or you know, issues in the matching processes that people use in practice that they otherwise might not have realized were important. So what I'm going to try and do in this lecture is help you guys see sort of more pieces of this map. So we'll talk a little bit more about many-to-one matching with contracts. We'll pick up you know, from Paul's lecture on Hatfield and Milgram and talk some more about some of John's results with Fuhiro Kojima about weakened substitutes conditions, sort of exactly what types of structure you need to make matching with contracts work. And then I'll bridge from some of John's and my work into many-to-many -many matching with contracts. And we'll sort of see that, in some sense, the structure in many-to-many -many matching with contracts is even a little bit cleaner than the structure in many-to-one matching with contracts. And that we can learn more about many-to-one matching models, which are more of what we've seen in practice, by thinking about many-to-many -many matching. So unlike the previous lecture, where I said, you know, many-to-many -many matching, it's very similar. Some things go haywire in the solution concepts. Now, actually, we'll use many-to-many -many matching as a prism to understand many-to-one matching. Then I'll talk about generalization. So I promised, when I mentioned the roommate problem example, I promised to come back to settings where there aren't just two sides to the market. And so I'll talk about Mike Ostrovsky's work on supply chain matching, where in fact there are sort of many sides to the market. The, you, know, you have a series of firms organized into a supply chain. And then at the end, I'll show you that when you add transfers back into the model, so now we're thinking about generalizations of Kelso Crawford. So sort of like in the structure of the last talk, this is all sort of general NTU or non-transferable or transferable utility. When you allow transfers, you can move even further past supply chain matching and think about arbitrary trading networks. And then as promised in the title and in the introduction, uh, you know, Throughout this talk, I'm going to be thinking a lot about substitutability and how different substitutability ideas sort of are the same and how the structure of matching depends on them. So throughout, I'll sort of try and give you different characterizations of substitutability that make the most sense for the different applications we're discussing. Uh, one more point of order is that for the most part, I've kept the notation on these slides and the original papers even notation, even though it varies tremendously across these papers. Um, so. I'll try and flag for you when we're changing notation, but please note that sort of each subtopic is mostly going to be in its own notation. Uh, I'm doing that for ease of ex post referencing. If you want to go and actually look at the original papers, um, it's useful to sort of be able to link them up with what I've shown you here directly. Okay, so uh, I'll try and warn you, but advance warn. I'll try and warn you locally, but advance global warning. The notation will change at points of the talk. All right, so many to one matching with contracts. What do we got? We have a set of doctors with a strict preference order over contracts. 
And a set of hospitals with strict preferences over, uh, sorry, typo, has strict preferences over sets of contracts associated to it. And uh, you know, what are contracts? Well, contracts are going to be elements of this product space, doctors cross hospitals cross terms. So there's some set of terms uh, throughout the talk today until we get to the very end. We'll be thinking about this as a finite set. Um, and you know, they specify information. So there are wages or hours worked or uh, you know, sort of you know, partnerships, whatever sort of associated data you want to store in your contract set. And in fact, so Paul put an equality here. But what we're talking about, you, know, you can embody this through preferences, or you can embody this through constraining the contract set. It's the same idea. You, know, you, have, you can have contracts that you sort of make unacceptable to people, or you can just limit the set of terms available to different doctors and hospitals. Our contract set will just be sort of an abstract object that names for each do contract a doctor and a hospital. OK? So we have this sort of abstract set of agreements we could make. And the agreements are going to be bilateral agreements between doctors and hospitals. And they contain maybe some other data. So as Paul said, if you forget about T, now you have our you know, standard doctor-hospital matching without any sort of other information. If T is something just like wages, then we get something like Kelso Crawford. If T is you know, wages and hours and you know, specific tasks and things, we get a more complicated set. But we can handle sort of any finite parameter space. OK? So what's an outcome? So, I'm gonna, so here I'm deviating a little bit from the uh, original language. So Paul used the term allocation. Uh, we're going to use the term outcome because we'll distinguish eventually between sort of outcomes in contract space and allocations in you know, competitive equilibrium in you know, GE type space. Um, but outcome allocation, in this case, the same thing. You know, it's a set of contracts that you know, names only one contract for each doctor. So we're going to limit ourselves to worlds at the moment in which doctors can only take a single contract. So note, yes? You might want to finish your sentence, but since I uh, mm, Go ahead. Uh, a lot of the, the, the nice results in, in matching theory uh, require strict, strict preferences. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get uh, Correct. So, what, what, how do you have to modify this to so, Eric's question is very good. So, the question is you know, it, we did all of matching on Monday and Tuesday with strict preferences. I've got strict preferences on the board already. Um, as soon as you think about wages being continuous, suddenly there are guaranteed to be indifferences because I could set your wage exactly equal to your reservation option of not working. Um, it turns out, and I will have to deal with indifferences explicitly in the last part of this talk. Um, it turns out that that doesn't introduce new problems other than technical annoyance. So like, then you have to give a substitutability definition that deals with you know, sets, of, you know, sets of contracts that are demanded in your demand set. And the analogous definition ends up being there exists at least one set of contracts in your demand set that has the right properties and things like that. Uh, we actually prove that you can, it's sort of without loss of generality to restrict to univalued demand and choice functions, that basically you can do sort of small wage perturbations um, that make it possible to effectively ignore these indifferences, which is exactly why the equivalence for the, with the indifferences holds. Um, but it's certainly something to think about, uh, but it doesn't affect the analysis much. Great question. Everyone OK with that? Cool. All right, so this is the basic model. We have choice functions. So remember, we have these underlying preference relations, preference of doctor, preference of hospitals. And we get choice functions. The doctor is going to choose his favorite contract with respect to his preference ordering. The hospitals are going to choose their favorite sets of contracts with respect to the preference ordering. This looks, remember, just like many to one matching, except now we're choosing contracts. So you're a doctor. You might be choosing a contract with a certain wage or with a certain you know, rule set. You know, you're going to be uh, working as a surgeon instead of as a general practitioner or something like that. OK? So so far, all very familiar. Uh, and having trouble with the clickers too. So remember, on you know substitutability, we said you know before, no doctor or no sorry we said uh, no student that makes you want another student. 
So now here it's going to be the same type of idea. There's no contract x that sometimes complements z in the sense that gaining access to x is going to make z more attractive. So formally, hospital H has substitutable preferences if for any pair of contracts x and z and some set of potential you know, sort of current opportunities y, if z isn't chosen when you just have y, giving you the opportunity to choose x doesn't now make you want to choose z. OK? So exact same idea we had before. So this substitutability concept is going to turn out to be extraordinarily robust. You know, this is going to be, in some sense, the right monotonicity condition throughout sort of all of generalized matching. And it's the same idea that is the right monotonicity condition you know, that gets us past responsive preferences in many to one matching. And then, you know, as Paul said, there's this equivalence. You know, another way to think about this is purely as a monotonicity condition. So the preferences of hospital H are substitutable if the rejection function is isotone. So essentially, uh, you know, gaining a new contract can never make you want to take back one you would have rejected before. All right? Cool. So this is, you know, this is going to be our first big workhorse. And we're going to see a whole bunch of different versions or slight tweaks on this condition. So it's really important that we get like this down, hence the reason I'm restating it. Cool. Yeah. Today is just a bad day for clickers. Uh, last thing to uh, think about in definition space, stability, our solution concept. We're going to impose, as before, individual rationality and unblockedness. Individual rationality just means that uh, for each agent, doctor or hospital, their choice from the, out uh, from the outcome A is going to be their assignment under A. So we'll use this subnotation for restriction. So A sub D is going to be the contract in A associated to Dr. D. And A sub H will be the set of contracts associated to hospital H. Unblockedness. So as before, we're going to require you know, that we can't get together a group of agents. So here we're going to do, instead of pairwise unblockedness, we're going to go straight to the group stability condition. We can't get together a group of agents and a set of contracts for them. So sort of new contracts, not in the outcome A, such that you know, everyone associated to these contracts wants to choose them. So possibly keeping old contracts in A. And this is very important. So the big distinction between stability and other sorts of common cooperative solution concepts is that we allow you potentially to keep other uh, you know, old contracts that you, instead of having to support the deviation entirely on your own. So at the end, if there's time, I'll talk a little bit more about the relationship of this type of stability concept to the core and to other more standard solution concepts. But here, what I want you to note is that we're imposing sort of both individual rationality and that blocks have to be self-supporting, but allowing you to keep, potentially allowing you to keep old contracts. And once we move to matching with contracts, these types of distinctions, which didn't matter very much before, are actually going to matter a lot. OK? Please. Ah, sorry. Yes. So this notation here. My apologies. Um, so C super capital letter is going to be the choice from all the, the union of the choice sets of all the doctors. So with this, the second part of this definition. So I said before, the hospital has to choose its associated contracts. The second part of the definition says that all the doctors associated to those contracts want them as well. Uh, that's right. So in particular, uh, the deviation is going, that's right. So if the doctors, when we go to many-to-many -many matching, the doctors might also want to keep their old contracts uh, or be able to keep some of their old contracts. But here, because they have unit demand and we're forcing them to choose them, exactly that they're, they're going to only take new contracts. Um, this, is, this is a, um, so D here is a set of all, OK. I think I understand the issue. So D here is the set of all doctors. But there are some doctors that aren't in, don't have contracts in Z. And so their choice from A union Z are going to be whatever they had in A, because Z has nothing for them. That's the wrong notation? Oh my goodness. I am, very, I am sorry. You were correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. This should be Z sub D. Sorry. Thank you. Good notational catch. Does everyone see the issue here? Huge typo on the slide. Uh, I apologize. Um, so this should be the doctor chooses his associated contract. And in particular, 
Oh, no, no, no. So, so take it back. I wrote this unclearly, but it's correct. Um, yeah, no, so it's correct as stated. My apologies. Um, this is the union of the set of contracts all the doctors choose. C super D. So in particular, all of the uh, contracts in Z are chosen by their associated doctors. So Z is going to be a subset of you know, all doctors' cho uh, chosen contracts. A perhaps better way to write this, which is what you guys were asking for, um, and you know, perhaps a proof that it would be clearer is that, yeah. Right. Exactly. So, uh, so exactly as Sergio is saying, uh, better, uh, perhaps better way to write this is that for each small d, z sub d. So the contract associated to that doctor small d, which could be empty if it's, if none in, in z. exactly, which could be empty, is in that doctor's choice set. Um, good. Sorry for the unclarity. Um, you know, apparently, you, apparently it must be really unclear because it made, uh, made it, me loop up on the slide myself. Um, does everyone get the concept now? Happiness? I see lots of nodding. Good. OK. So that's our unblockedness condition. Thank you, and thank you. <laughs> All right. So the, sort of the big theorem um, and the, you know, the big underlying existence result is that uh, if we have substitutable preferences for the hospitals, then there exists a non-empty finite lattice of fixed points. Remember, uh, we had these you know, opportunity sets of the generalized deferred acceptance operator that correspond exactly to the set of stable outcomes. And so this is sort of you know, a huge deal, right? Like we get in a single theorem existence and lattice structure and even something about the structure of what the different sets that make up this lattice really mean. Right? We sort of learn that these are the places where, where the opportunities, you know, there's, it's like market clearing, right? There, you know, we find the set of contracts where the, the two opportunity sets the two, uh, and the two choice, bleh, the two chosen opportunity sets coincide. Right? You know, the things people want, you know, the doctors are providing exactly the services the hospitals want them to provide. And so this is you know, really, really striking. And one of the first questions you ask when you look at it is, is there a converse? Right? You know, sort of substitutability is this you know, really, really important structural condition. Is that exactly what we need? Sorry, I'm 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 a yep. from, what is x super d? I'm sorry. Ah, x super d and x super h. Uh, sorry, so here we're in, uh, in Paul's previous lecture. These are going to be the sets of contracts that are sort of Sorry, it's too early in the morning. Sorry, right, so I'm referencing the previous lecture here. Um, the, uh, we have this generalized deferred acceptance operator in which doctors and hospitals are sort of going to look at you know, opportunity sets of contracts, you know, offer sets, uh, take, you know, hold the offers they want, reject all the others. And so these are going to be opportunity sets for the doctors and the hospitals. And it's exactly sort of at the fixed points where the agreements or the opportunities that coincide, the things that both the doctors want to keep out of their opportunity set and that the hospitals want to keep give you a stable outcome. OK, so you weren't here at the previous lecture. but I, uh, So relative, relative to previous lecture, do, are we OK uh, to go forward? OK, uh, we'll talk, we'll talk after, offline. Um, OK, so key question, what about a converse? Is, you know, sort of, is this? exactly what we want. Well, so it turns out, and this is very strange, and I hope to convince you later that it's not very strange, but it feels very strange, and it sort of, you know, turns out that you don't exactly need substitutability to guarantee the existence of stable outcomes in many to one matching with contracts. So I want to give you sort of one very simple example. So we're going to imagine a single hospital with these sort of Unusual preferences. Um, so what is this? So there are two potential contract types, the alpha contract and the beta contract. And there are two doctors, you know, Mr. X and Mr. Z. And so the first contract will be, you know, first contract X alpha. This is like, you know, you can think about this and in a few minutes I'll really label these exactly this way. This is going to be, you know, Dr. X doing research. And you, your hospital, you know, also has clinicians and beta is going to be clini clinical work. And so you know, Dr. X doing research and Dr. Z doing clinical work is your best outcome. But failing that, you know, if you can't get a research division and a clinical division, you'd like to have you know, 
a clinical division. It's sort of pretty lame to have a hospital without a clinical division, just a research division. And so your preferences over singletons actually just rank the beta contracts first. And Dr. X, maybe Dr. X is a really smart doctor, right? He knows how to do research, and he, you know, and he can do clinical better than Z. And so you have these very natural preferences where having both divisions is your favorite choice, but then failing that, you'd really like Dr. X to be doing your clinical work if you only get one of them. And so there's actually a complementarity here, right? Because if I give you X beta and Z beta, you're just going to choose uh, X beta. But now if I give you sort of X beta, Z beta, and X alpha, you know, so as soon as you gain X alpha, you move over here. You take X alpha and you take back Z beta. Right? So under the definition of substitutability I gave you, this is a complementarity. You know, the X and Z labels, in fact, match the labels in the definition. Getting X alpha makes you want Z beta more. So I haven't uh, you know, written it out for you, but you can check. And in a few minutes, the reason I haven't written it out is not because I think the checking is you know, long and tedious, but rather because I'm going to give you a very quick proof of this in a few minutes. But it actually turns out that for any choice of doctor preferences, no matter what they are, singleton you know, unit demand over these contracts, is there any way I assign the preferences of x and z, there's going to be a stable outcome. And so here I have non-substitutable hospital preferences for which stable outcomes are still guaranteed. So you know, we now see that an immediate converse, you know, just you know, so existence of stable outcomes requires substitutability, isn't quite going to work, because I've just given you a counterexample to the co a converse you might have imagined. So we're going to have to do something else. And what we're going to do is we're going to uncover the structure of you know, where these types of examples come from and use that to learn a little bit more about what you need to guarantee the existence of stable outcomes. And again, the reason we're doing this is because sometimes we run into real markets that have non-substitutable preferences, but where we'd like to do stable matching. And it's good to know whether we can, right? Or you know, what you have to do to be able to, right? You know, whether you want to be using large market mechanisms or something like this to really you know, sort of solve your complementarity problems, or whether just sort of you know, clever reading of the preference relations can solve them for you. All right. So remember, here's our substitutability definition. The preferences of hospital H are substitutable if I can't give you an X that makes you want to take back a Z you would have previously rejected. I've seen, uh, this has been on the board a lot. I'm going to tweak it very slightly. So this definition is due to Hatfield and Kojima. Sorry, yep. Can I ask a question Please. about the example? Yes. So, so you, you're arguing that there is a stable outcome mm -hmm. uh, for any doctor preference. Can it be found by a, always be found by a generalized yes. uh, preferred acceptance of it? Yes, indeed. So, it, um, so in particular, this class of exam there's a class of examples of which this is one. Uh, actually, there are two different classes of examples this one represents. One of them is this type. Um, but uh, there are two classes of examples that this represents. And in both cases, deferred acceptance is going to work. So that's true. So it, when I made this claim about applications, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, it's good to ha know what structure you're going to use uh, to guarantee the existence of stable outcomes unless we can also find them. But luckily, here we can. Great question. All right. Um, so the tweak, first tweak. Hospital's preferences are unilaterally substitutable. If now, so this part's the same, right? For all contracts z and x and y sub z equal to x, difference, big difference is right here in the middle of the definition. Dr. Z is not associated to any contracts, or, or the doctor, sorry, associated to z is not associated to any contracts in y. Now the substitutability outcome or um, condition holds. So now it's the case that you do. Uh, you don't choose z given x if you didn't choose z before. So the one change, we added this new rule that says, you know, Dr. Z, the guy whose contract might in principle be moving around, uh, isn't associated with yd. And remember also, so this is you know, many to one matching, so it's also going to turn out that Dr. Z, the doctor associated to z is not the doctor associated to x. But so the, the real key here is that we've ruled out the possibility that you already have an offer from Z. We can weaken this condition even further by now restricting that both the doctor associated to Z and the doctor associated to X are not associated to any of the contracts in Y. So now, so this is sort of, 
you might be renegotiating with Mr. X when you get X, but you're not renegotiating with Mr. Z. Now you're not going to be renegotiating with either of them. These two new contracts over which you are substitutable um, you know, have nothing to do with this set of other alternatives Y that you already had. So everyone see that these are weakenings of the substitutability condition? So sort of I've, I've taken this and added more constraints on the types of uh, non-substitutabilities we're ruling out. One more. So unilateral, bilateral, weak. I promise you, so there will be like three slides in this talk that are messy lists of substitutability conditions in one fashion or another. Uh, I promise you this is going to be the sort of most dense of them. And the other two will have more symbols, but will be simpler. Um, and almost all you need to get from this slide is the systematic weakening of these concepts. Because the bottom one and, uh, and the top one are going to sort of be the keys. So last one, weak substitutability. We're also going to impose that Y contains only one contract with each doctor. So it's bilateral substitutability with the additional rule that Y has no possible renegotiations with multiple doctors in it. What does this condition mean? This one actually like, has an intuitive meaning. Um, weak substitutability means that doctors are substitutes. Contracts with them might not be. But it's not the case that two doctors sort of directly complement each other. It needs to be that sort of, uh, you know, when you restrict to sort of sets of contracts that only have one contract with each doctor, your preferences look substitutable. And it should be pretty quick to see that if we don't satisfy this condition, then our old negative results are going to kick in. You know, if the doctors themselves don't look like substitutes on their own, leaving aside all these contract terms, it's going to be really hard to find stable outcomes. Uh, yes, so here ZD and XD will also be different. Yeah, so in all of these, by the, if ZD, the doctors associated to Z and X, good question, Sergio. So Z, the question is, how do we know that ZD and XD are different in these conditions? Because I haven't said that explicitly. If ZD and XD are the same, it can't be the case because we've only allowed hospitals to choose a single contract with a given doctor. It can't be the case that getting x will also make you want z, because you can take at most one of these. And if, ah, now here's something I haven't said. All right. Um, so I left out something that's floating in the background here, because I set up preference relations. So both Paul and I presented these uh, models from the structure that there's an underlying doctor preference relation and an underlying hospital preference relation. Uh, it turns out you could define all of this yoga in terms of just choice functions. But if you do that, uh, and this is a, a very recent finding uh, due to Aigun and Sunmez, if you define everything just in terms of choice functions, then you actually need to add a rule that says contracts that you're rejecting don't change your preferences. You know, contracts that you choose not to take don't change the other contracts you take. So there's an irrelevance of rejected contracts condition. Either you get this automatically if your preferences are derived from a, uh, from a preference relation. So if your choice function is induced by a preference relation directly, as we've set it up here, you get this condition for free. But you could use the choice functions as the primitive and impose it directly. And you actually do get a broader set of potential choice functions. But either when you have a preference relation, or more generally, when you have this irrelevance of rejected contracts, x can't change whether you take z unless you also take x. And so in particular, if you're going to take x, and z is with the same doctor, you're not going to take z. And so that's the answer to the original question. But as you can see, it's, sort of, it's non-trivial to think through in the sense that knowing why this is true actually sort of requires understanding a little bit more of the structure of choice in these problems. Um, not going to be very necessary for the rest of our discussion today, but worth thinking about. So the, you know, this idea of taking the choice functions as primitives is quite valuable. And, um, and again, sort of knowing exactly what you need for a revealed preference-like structure to appear in choice, because we use revealed preference-like ideas under the hood in some of the proofs, it's really important. OK? So sorry, close, you know, close footnote. That was, that was our footnote on revealed preference and preference relation and choice function primitives. Uh, everybody stretch. You know, we're, uh, uh, you know. Back to the, uh, the slide I already showed you. Um, we were looking for a converse. What I was about to say is that 
if doctors don't sort of locally look like substitutes, you know, if doctors themselves aren't substitutable, then it's going to be really hard to get stable outcomes. And in fact, that's what we find. So Hatfield and Kojima showed that you know, if there are at least two hospitals, so now we're outside of this cumulative offer setting we that Paul talked about at the end of his talk, if there are at least two hospitals, and the preferences of some hospital are not weakly substitutable, then we can find you know, very simple preferences for all the other agents in the market such that no stable outcome exists. And so this is sort of the converse to, sort of, to the existence theorem from Hatfield and Milgram. And note that there's a little bit of a gap, right? So I put all of these conditions on the board. I gave you bilateral substitutability and unilateral substitutability. It would be kind of rude of me to do this if they didn't tell us anything. Um, it turns out, and this is a, a later paper of Hatfield and Kojima, that bilateral substitutability is enough to guarantee the existence of one stable outcome. And in fact, in a very recent paper, um, it was shown that bilateral substitutability is actually enough to guarantee that the cumulative offer process is order independent. So we mentioned this order independence fact uh, two days ago. And I said, you know, it's highly non-trivial that you get order independence in general. Um, turns out bilateral substitutability is like somehow the right condition for that as well. And unilateral substitutability, so the reason I gave you these, these intermediate conditions, that's actually what you need for a lot of the usual results. So, you know, that gives you not just existence, but also lattice structure, uh, rural hospitals under the law of aggregate demand. Sort of the world is well behaved when hospitals' preferences are unilaterally substitutable. And so, now note, I did something a little bit odd, which is I gave you the theorems in the order weak, bilateral, unilateral. And I gave you the conditions in the order unilateral, bilateral, weak. So the order actually flips. The reason for that is that these conditions successively weaken the substitutability condition. Um, and then these theorems sort of successively get stronger. Or these successively get stronger. And this one sort of shows you the gap. Uh, but do keep track of this. So like I, I did just reverse the order on the slides uh, on you. Yes? That's right. Yeah. The, um, I would say, so speaking of, sorry, so the, the, I should repeat it for the recording. The question was, in the, for the middle theorem, are there counterexamples uh, that show you that we don't, say, have lattice structure or rural hospitals or things like that when you would just have bilaterally substitutable preferences? And the answer is yes. Um, all of that is in this very slick paper of uh, John and Fujito's. Um, I should say that. I think it's still sort of an open question why exactly some of these things work. So the argument for why we need weak substitutes makes a lot of sense. Um, but sort of understanding exactly what unilateral substitutability and bilateral substitutability are bringing to the table that allows this structure to be restored, and I think we understand better for unilateral substitutes than bilateral substitutes. But even more generally, like you can sort of you can work through the arguments and understand sort of where the theorems come from, but it doesn't quite make it clear why this structure works. So something worth thinking about maybe if you're really interested in sort of structural problems for matching models is to think about exactly what these conditions mean, why they work. Um, yes. Yes, so good question. So the question is, first I said substitutability is sufficient but not necessary. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a converse? We knew exactly where the necessary conditions were. And then I showed you unnecessary condition and two sufficient conditions. Um, we don't know what the necessary and sufficient condition is. Um, and in a second, I'm going to show you a reason why this problem is even harder than we may have first thought just from Hatfield Kojima. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's definitely the case that what we're trying to do is understand how the structure lays out. And we don't have an answer that's as sharp as we would like. We don't have a necessary and sufficient condition. Great question. Also something we're thinking about, but I should give it with the caveat that, to the best of my knowledge, this problem is very hard. Um, OK. So I gave you this example before. It turns out it satisfies some of these weaker substitutability conditions. And so that's going to give us one explanation for, uh, for why our stable outcomes exist. Right? So in particular, uh, we have preferences only over pairs of contracts. And so these restrictions I put on the con sets of other contracts you might have available, why, 
are all going to hold trivially, right? Because you know y can't contain any, uh, or rather, at least for the uh, you know for. I didn't state that very clearly. I apologize. These preferences are going to satisfy some of our weaker substitutability conditions. Um, I unfortunately don't have a super slick way to give you that directly. Um, you can write it down and test it, or I can show you a very, very quick argument for why stable outcomes exist. So I'm going to do that now. Um, consider a single hospital with these same preferences. So remember, before I gave you sort of these labels. Alpha is going to be a research contract. Beta is going to be a clinical contract. Um, the, uh, I'm going to relabel them so that these should be really easy to memorize, I hope at least. Um, so we have two doctors. One of them is named Dr. Sherlock, and the other one is named Dr. Watson. Dr. Sherlock is smarter than Watson. OK, sound familiar? Does this like ring a bell in anybody's head? Good, OK. Um, so Dr. Sherlock is so smart that he can do research or clinical, and he can do clinical better than Watson can. So your favorite thing to do, you, like if you were writing a book about both of them, you'd love to have Sherlock be the researcher and Watson be the clinician. Um, but if you can't get both of them, like you know, you'll, you'll put Sherlock in the clinical room before you'll just have him do research. And so your true preferences over sets of contracts are Sherlock research, Watson clinical, beats Sherlock clinical, beats Watson clinical, beats Sherlock research. OK? So that's, that's the world. And know that this, you know, the doctors are going to have their own preferences. So maybe for some reason, you know, if you, uh, you know, maybe Sherlock really likes being a clinician, and so he's going to find the clinical contract preferable to the research contract. But if you, for any choice of you know, doctor preferences you write down, there's going to be a stable outcome. Why? Well, the answer is Hospital H actually wants to hire two Sherlocks. Right? If you were writing a really good mystery novel, you'd want you know, your, uh, your Dr. Sherlock to be both your researcher and your clinician. Or think how many lives you could save if he both figures out you know, what the problem is and then saves them. And so your true underlying preference relation says not just this piece we saw before, but actually that your favorite outcome in the world would be to have Sherlock do both jobs. So now remember before, where was the non-substitutability? The complementarity was between the, uh, you know, the Watson clinical contract and the Sherlock research contract. right? It, before, if I get Sherlock Clinical and Sherlock Research, I take Sherlock Clinical. Now, if I get Sherlock Clinical, Watson Clinical, and Sherlock Research, I take Sherlock Research and Watson Clinical. Complementarity. Well, what happens if I actually you know, look at your true preferences? You want Sherlock to do both. Before I give you Sherlock Clinical and Sherlock Research, you just go straight here. You're all over the moon. Getting Watson Clinical doesn't do anything. You have your favorite outcome. Everyone see that? OK. So now note something. If we want to think about stable matching in this context with these sorts of extended preference relations, doctors, many to one matching, doctors have unit demand. So if there's a stable outcome, remember one of the conditions of stability is individual rationality. This set is not individual ra individually rational for doctors. If I assign you know, Sherlock both jobs, he's just going to walk away from one of them. And so in particular, if I can prove sort of that this preference relation guarantees the existence of stable outcomes, which in a minute I will show you because it's substitutable, it will, then in fact, the stable outcome has to be somewhere over here. It can't be that set with the two Sherlock assignments. But if that's true, there must be a stable outcome in the original preferences too. So I sort of, by faking us out, by adding this true preference over the two Sherlocks, I could show us that the stable out, there should be a stable outcome. And in fact, the stable outcome lives in the original preference space. Bingo. Uh, which is, in fact, exactly what we call the condition. We call it substitutable completability. If you can sort of complete preferences by adding preferences over infeasible sets, such that you get a substitutable preference relation, then it's going to turn out that you have you know, sort of a lot of your previous theorems inherited from many-to-many -many matching in many-to-one matching with settings without, with certain non-substitutable preferences. Exactly. All right. So 
This tells us, and this is going to be our bridge from many to one to many to many, this tells us that many to many matching with contracts might have something to say. So it turns out, so before, remember, in my previous lecture, I had many to many matching on one slide. Many to many matching with contracts will fit on a couple of slides because it looks very, very similar. So first of all, preference substitutability, which now we have to impose on every single agent, not just the hospitals, but also the doctors, because we're in principle going to allow the doctors to take multiple contracts, is sufficient to guarantee the existence of a lattice of stable outcomes. And in fact, you know, the exact same generalized deferred acceptance operator. So this is you know, another way in which the Hatfield and Milgram paper is a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, you know, this generalized deferred acceptance operator, no matter how much we've expanded the domain, keeps working. Sort of like it's the right interpretation of deferred acceptance in some sense for these generalized matching models. Um, you, know, you move to many to many matching, you can rephrase it in different ways, but it's the same operator. And moreover, if we assume the law of aggregate demand now for all agents, so remember this is monotonicity in cardinality, so if I give you, you know, a larger opportunity set, you choose weekly more contracts. Again, we get a rural hospitals theorem, and to the greatest extent possible, which isn't much, we get you know, a positive incentive result. You get for the agents who have unit demand, um, the, the, so if for doctors that have unit demand in your many-to-many -many matching world, um, you get defer, uh, deferred acceptance, doctor proposing, suitably generalized, guarantees uh, dominant strategy truthfulness. But it's not much. So when you move to many-to-many -many matching, essentially your incentive results go away. And now we can see why our you know, two Sherlock's example is going to give us stable outcomes, right? You know, so now we have a many-to-many -many substitutable preference relation. As I said before, the stable outcome lies somewhere in this bottom part of the preference relation from the original market. And moreover, you know, this happens to also satisfy the law of aggregate demand and so forth. So when the completion, and this is it's a little bit stickier to say exactly what this means, but when you you know, complete the preferences and get something that satisfies the law of aggregate demand, then, you'll, uh, then you get sort of rural hospitals in the completed market. Uh, I should say, in principle, it's possible to choose different completions of a preference relation and get different stable outcomes as the set of stable outcomes, but not a different result in the doctor proposing algorithm. So you know, cumulative offer process, doctor proposing still gives you the same outcome. But the choice of completion might affect the whole set of stable outcomes that you see. So there might be outcomes stable with respect to the original preferences that don't look stable if you pick a certain completion. Um, so how things like rural hospitals and lattice, theory, uh, lattice structure and stuff lift to the completed world is a little bit complicated. But again, somehow many to, you know, many to many matching with contracts gives us a little bit more power than we, ha we had before in many to one matching with contracts. And this is kind of fun. Um, yes, fun, party? Uh, fine. OK. So preference substitutability is key. Now, there are differences between many-to-many -many and many-to-one matching with contracts. So first of all, I just showed you that in many-to-one matching with contracts, you can do a really, really quick proof that you don't need preference substitutability. Because there are some preferences that are like projections of substitutable preferences from many-to-many -many space that don't look substitutable in the many-to-one matching world, but are substitutable as sort of suitably completed preferences. By contrast, in many-to-many -many matching with contracts, preference substitutability is actually necessary. So you do need substitutability to guarantee the existence of stable outcomes. And thus, again, we see this you know, bad news for couples fact that we've been seeing. And so we've you know, already seen a bunch about why this might be mitigated in practice. But sort of, uh, you know, again, this piece of the structure remains. So as you sort of move above many to one matching with contracts, it remains the case that you need substitutability to guarantee the existence of stable outcomes. And so this, conver this is sort of the converse we looked for before and didn't find. When we move to you know, yet more complicated generalized matching models, it comes back. Yes? So many to many is the doctor can also send it to different hospitals. Yes. How, how about treat couples as one agent who demand two hospitals? Right. Yeah, yeah. OK, good question. So 
Um, there are actually two pieces to this question on the answer in turn. So um, first statement, many-to-many uh, -many matching with contracts. Doctors can sign contracts with multiple hospitals. That is totally right. Um, but something that I haven't said yet and I'm about to talk in detail about in sort of the bottom part of this slide that you can't see yet, um, also for this necessity result, to the best of our knowledge, you need also in principle that doctors could sign multiple contracts with the same hospital. So it might be that, so you think about different sort of sub-positions of the hospital being categorized by separate contracts. So if you're a doctor who works part of your time as a you know, radiologist and part of your time as a general practitioner, um, those are sort of separate contract components. Um, second question, uh, and we'll talk in a second about why that's sometimes good to assume and sometimes not. Second question, um, when we think about many-to-many -many matching, can we think about couples as a single agent? And the answer is yes. So when I say this is bad news for couples, that's exactly because the way to think about couples in terms of many-to-many -many matching is you're a single agent who wants to take pairs of contracts. But your pairs of contracts, because you're a couple, usually, you know, are complements. You know, it's if your spouse gets a job in you know one city, you also want to be in the same city. Everyone see that? Yes. Do you have two wages at the same hospital? What do you mean exactly? Ah. Yes. So, um, so what we're actually going to use is that just that you, in principle, could take multiple contracts with the same hospital. Um, and they'll just be abstract contracts. They could be any type of contract. So the question, you know, the question is, is it OK? You know, I said two different jobs, radiology versus general practitioner. Those are separate contracts. Could they just be two different wages? They could be different wages, different hours, something, just two different contracts with the same hospital. You might, in principle, want to sign. Yes? Why does the identity of the hospital Ah. OK, so this is a very deep question. The question is, why does the identity of the hospital matter? Why don't you just take the position separately as seats in a school? So the answer is, sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can sort of aggregate all the pieces together and think about sort of, and sometimes you might even, for modeling purposes, want to. Think about a single agent who has sort of a bunch of different processing structures to, th to use. Um, in practice, of course, that's often not right. So like in practice, if we want to think about sort of a broader version of the medical match or something, you know, we're not going to have the hospitals you know, submit preferences as a group. They're all going to submit their individual preferences. But there's no reason in principle why the computer system couldn't aggregate them all together. The general answer to this question is going to touch on a lot of things that I don't really understand yet. But the, the way we do all of this labeling, in fact, let me just click. You know, Click to the next piece of the slide. The way we do all of this labeling and bundling and unbundling of contracts actually greatly affects the set, you know, which preferences look substitutable and can also affect, even without changing substitutability, the set of stable outcomes. And so you know, at some abstract level, it's not depending on the way you try and bind all of these different preferences together. You may or may not drastically change the way your market looks to your deferred acceptance algorithm. Um, and at least for the examples and settings that I'm aware of, thinking about the hospitals as individual agents and then trying to understand what the structure of their set preferences are is the most natural way to sort of work, to make the math work well. But there are certainly times, and I don't think it's known exactly, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's certainly times I don't think it's known exactly when aggregating the agents together is or is not problematic. Right? And we know sometimes we have an auctioneer. So Paul talked at the end of his lecture about the cumulative offer process. Sometimes having a single agent on the other side is actually really helpful. Um, but in terms of its ability to express and reflect the preferences that the hospitals themselves have, it doesn't always work. But yeah, that's a very deep question. So, like, so what I'm about to show you right now actually is just scratching the surface of an open area that I don't really know how to think about, but that maybe you guys can. Um, so. I said right a second ago that for this necessity result, we have to allow multiple contracts between a doctor-hospital pair. We have to think about when and how we want to do that. So now here's our Sherlock example again. Remember, a saying that you really want Sherlock to do both jobs is exactly what showed us the substitutability of the preferences. Right? So this is the third time I've put this example up. Hopefully we have it down by now. 
what if instead I just sort of had this rule? I'm a hospital. I, uh, you know, my hospital administrator says all contracts with a single doctor have to be bound into a single document. You know, so just it's a it's a technical imposition. But instead of writing SR comma SC, I'm writing S super R comma C. All I've done is relabel the notation, right? We can all see that these are the same thing, but the market design system maybe can't. And in fact, now the complementarity remains. Because there's no relation between your preferences over the, the unbundled contracts C and R, SC and SR and your preferences over this bundle contract SRC. And so while these are sort of exactly the same in terms of expressing the hospital's preferences, writing them down one way shows substitutability and the other one doesn't. Even though, you know, same theorems are true about them, right? Stable outcomes are guaranteed under both, and in fact, they live, both live down here in the, in the true many-to-one preference relation. But just the way I labeled the contracts makes it hard to see substitutability. So that's an issue. So suddenly, the, way, the language we use to specify our contracts matters. Let me be even a little scarier. Uh, this example is due to Al. The first time I showed him some of this stuff, he said, wait, 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 but what about work and wages? So here's a very natural set of preferences. So look at the bottom first. Uh, we have a guy, Mr. X. He uh, would rather work and be paid than do nothing. And you know, his employer would rather hire him and pay him than do nothing. But you know, oh, I gave this, I gave this in backwards order. Left is the guy, right is the employer. You know, really, truly, wouldn't we all rather uh, you know, just be paid and not have to work? So if I unbundle this work and wage contract, you know, suddenly your, your true preferences say, sure, I'd like to work and be paid, but I'd much rather just be paid. And your employer says, you know, wow, I'd love for you to work and have me pay you, but it would be much better if you just worked for free. And so both times we have substitutable preferences, but now the set of stable outcomes moves, right? So when we bundle the contract terms together, we get a stable outcome where you know, the employee works and the employer pays him. But if I unbundle them, suddenly that outcome is no longer individually rational. Both the employee and the employer want to throw out half of the deal, and they don't agree about which half to throw out. So again, this like multiple, so before, allowing multiple contracts between a doctor-hospital pair was actually really positive, right? It you know, enabled us to find stable outcomes. Now, it can change the set of stable outcomes we have, possibly in a way that's sort of not you know, one we really think is right. So, uh, if we first negotiate and we both come to the table and he says, well, how about you work for free? And I say, how about you pay me for nothing? And we very quickly figure out that's not actually you know, the outcome we want, but we probably get here, not there. So if we imagine our algorithm telling us, oh, sorry, it turns out all the employees in the world want to be paid for free and you know, for nothing, and all the employers want their workers to work for free, nobody's going to work, that doesn't sound much like sort of a natural economic outcome. And so as market designers, we actually have to look a lot at the structure of the problem to understand sort of which of these you know, phrasings of the contract second is right. And we don't have much of a general theory for doing that. OK? All right, so entertainment aside, let's you know, like stretch even a little bit more and say, well, what about supply chains? So now we've moved from many to many matching. So before, you know, maybe Mr. I matches with lots of Mr. B's over here, and each B matches with lots of Mr. I's. Now. But even so, we still had a two-sided market. Now, we're going to add multiple sides to the market. So I is going to be an intermediary who intermediates between a supplier and some buyers. OK. Substitutability is again going to be key. But what we mean by substitutability is going to be a little bit different than what we meant before. So same side contracts are going to be substitutes. And cross-side contracts are going to be complements. So what this means is that if you're an intermediary guy here, you're someone who trades with people above you and below you. There's going to be an order that says sort of you only buy from people above you in the order and sell to people below you in the order. So you're Mr. I, buying from supplier S and selling to buyers B1 and B2. If I give you more opportunities to buy inputs from sellers, you're weakly less interested in inputs. So like your, all of your, your purchase contracts substitute for each other in the way we had before. 
And meanwhile, all of your sale contracts, all the things you might sell to buyers substitute. So if a new buyer shows up, you, you are weakly less interested in the buyers you had before. You know, maybe, you know, maybe now you'll sell to this new guy dropping somebody else, but you won't want to take back a potential buyer you had previously. So in each side of Mr. I, contracts look like substitutes exactly the way we had them before. Okay? So that's the first part. Same side contracts, substitutes just like we already saw. But cross-side complements, contracts are going to be complements. So now if I get more inputs, I can sell more outputs. This basically means that there's an underlying substitutability of goods. You know, Mr. I has a shop that turns inputs into outputs, and sort of input suppliers are substitutes, output purchasers are substitutes. You know, if you only make five copies of an item, you can only sell it to you know five different guys. But if you get an input that lets you make the sixth, now maybe you want a new buyer who will take the sixth output. Okay? So we call this full substitutability. And you know, Mike Ostrovsky was the first person to realize that you can actually do matching without two sides to the market. And so he showed, using a slightly different solution concept, but it's essentially the same theorem, and it's using the same sort of generalized deferred acceptance operator we had before, that if all agents' preferences are fully substitutable in one of these sort of big supply chain markets, then there exists a non-empty lattice of stable outcomes. So exactly the same workhorse approach gets you a lattice of stable outcomes in these very general supply chain networks. And the key is this combination of same-side substitutability and cross-side complementarity. Okay. Just as a footnote, the supply chain structure is actually really important. If instead you have a cyclic contract set, so now um, you have a very simple world with one cycle. Mr. F2 only wants to sell his widget if he can buy a gadget. And F1 really wants to buy a widget, but would rather sell his gadget to G than to F2. Everyone see that? So. Y and X2, it's F1's most preferred. I sell gadget to G, I buy widget from F2. I claim that there's no stable outcome in this picture. Pretty quick to see, empty set, not stable because F1 and F2 will get together. Sure, you know, I'll sell you my gadget, you sell me your widget. Oh wait, but now I'm getting a widget, so we're here, right? I'm getting a widget, let me sell my gadget to G, I like that even more. And so F1 deviates here. But now F2 says, oh, no, 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 no. You don't get my widget unless uh, I get your gadget. And so he cancels X2. Then F1 cancels Y, and we end up back at the empty set. So any set of contracts we might choose here are going to get us you know, to some blocking opportunity. So theorem, proven very quickly by example, you need acyclicity for stability in general. So if you have one of these worlds without Guarantee without transfers, so like the Ostrovsky supply chain model, you actually need the supply chain structure. Kind of yes? Wait, wait, when you say that it, 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 it's necessary, you mean given a, not, given a cyclic structure, you can always create preferences. That's right. You, you, might, you might be lucky and have preferences. Correct. For, for Great question. So Eric asks, um, when I say necessary, I mean I can find preferences if there's at least one potential contract cycle such that no stable outcome is guaranteed. That's right. So as with all the other necessity theorems I've been stating, it's a maximal domain result. So there exist some preferences for all the agents that happen to be fully substitutable such that uh, you know, stable outcomes don't exist. Great question. Yes? Uh, that's true, although you'd also sort of fail to express part of F1's preferences. You wouldn't be able to see this part of his preference. So the question is, what if we bundle X1 and X2? It's true. So then we get that this is, these are each you know, X1, X2 single contracts. This Y, X2 option doesn't even really exist, or maybe does sort of with a second X2 contract floating around here. So that's right. So if you bundle and reorganize things, um, maybe you can get stable outcomes for any individual example, but I can find alternate preferences for those sorts of cyclic worlds. Again, where stable outcomes don't exist. So here it's, it's 
not like in the, <coughs> so um, you're saying that unlike the, the case of the worker where the bundle thing and everything works out suddenly, in, the, in this case it doesn't. Uh, right, so the question is, unlike in the case before with many-to-many -many matching, where sort of when I bundle things or unbundle them, we sort of get substitutability and the world is happy, um, here the maximal domain result, because it's a maximal domain theorem, um, even with bundling, so long as I leave the possibility of cyclic trade, I can find other preferences such that stable outcomes are guaranteed. However, one sec, Al. Um, unless, actually, do you want to do something? Right. Talking about who can trade with whom. It's, 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 it's not what the contract clause is, it's what the underlying graph, and you can have trade going from F1 to F2 or from F2 to F1, and that's the problem. Right. Yeah, sorry. So Al, Al's phrasing this is very helpful. So uh, the statement here is that we're talking across purposes because I'm talking about the underlying graph of who can buy and sell from whom. And the question was, if I, you know, can I bundle contracts to solve that problem? The answer is, yes, sometimes I can bundle contracts to solve that problem. But in, if I don't change the underlying graph, you know, if I don't make it the case that there are uh, not any cycles in the underlying graph, then I can still find preferences such that no stable outcome exists. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, what, I'm about to, what I was about to say is that what we'll see in a few minutes is that you know, somehow what you really want, if you're thinking as an, as an economist, you know, your intuition is that this problem shouldn't really exist because F1 or some, if somebody should just pay somebody else the externality. Right? If F1 really wants to deviate to contract Y, he should pay F2 something in exchange for the loss of the gadget. And that is, in fact, going to be a solution. So as soon as we allow everyone to make transfers and associate all the trades with underlying transfers, stable outcomes will be guaranteed again. Again, given fully substitutable preferences. Itai. Uh, so Itai says, you know, something's going to happen in the world. So even if we don't have transfers associated with these contracts, maybe each of these outcomes is like kind of stable because people will do something with beliefs to get out of the possibility of cycling. Um, yeah, so forward-lookingness in these models is always hard to think about and interpret in terms of exactly what it means in practice. Um, there, you know, certainly, like, you know, if, in a world with these sorts of contracting structures, they probably are doing something that's given their beliefs about cycling. There's a solution concept by Chue that's like a type of forward-looking consistency that basically says, you know, you won't move to an outcome that you know somebody else will move you away from, or something like that. Um, so in particular, like maybe F1 won't move to this because you know won't move to contract with G because then F2 will break his contract with F1, and so it might be that like this X1 X2 match, for example, is consistent. Um, Nobody, to the best of my knowledge, has a good, like a really, really strong uh, sense of how to deal with these forward-looking stability concepts in these more general models. Although I've heard Al has some things to say about some of the, uh, you know, the forward-looking stability in other uh, classes of games. <laughs> He's just shaking his head. Fair enough. Uh, great question. Worth thinking about. Okay, uh, let me move on from cyclic contract sets. Uh, one more thing about the uh, world with supply chains. Remember our rural, hosp rural hospitals theorem. So, in many to one or many to many matching with contracts, if all preferences are substitutable and satisfy the law of aggregate demand, then each doctor and hospital will sign the same number of contracts at every stable outcome. In supply chains, this isn't the natural version of this, that you sign the same number of contracts is not actually true. So what's the issue? And apologies, there's a very major typo which has somehow been propagated on this slide since the very first talk I gave uh, on this like four years ago. Um, this here should be a Y. So there's, the world is there's a seller and a buyer and an intermediary. The seller prefers to sell through the intermediary, but the buyer prefers to buy directly. And the intermediary would like to do trade. So there are actually two stable outcomes here. One, where everyone passes through the intermediary. So the seller sells through X, the buyer buys through Y. The seller is getting his favorite opportunity so they can't so nobody can block with him. The second one is direct sale. The seller sells to the buyer directly through Z. Now the buyer is getting his favorite opportunity so there's no blocking with him. And note that in one of these trades, you know, one of these outcomes, sorry, 
the intermediary does two contracts, and in the other, he does none. So some simple version of this theorem where it's the same number of contracts isn't going to go through. However, it turns out that sort of the right generalization of the rural hospitals theorem is a statement about excess demand. So suppose that the contract set is acyclic and that all preferences are fully substitutable and satisfy both the law of aggregate demand and the analogous law of aggregate supply. So one of these is going to be about the, you know, your buy side and one of them is going to be about your sell side. Then for every agent, the difference between your number, the number of buy contracts and sell contracts is going to be a constant. So note here, in both situations, the intermediary ended up with nothing. So he bought a good and sold it, or he didn't do anything. In both cases, his excess stock is 0. And more generally, sort of the excess stock will be a constant. So that's the sort of fully generalized rural hospitals theorem. In the last, uh, excellent, the last 25 minutes, uh, well, 20 of the last 25 minutes, and then I'll talk briefly about applications, I want to talk about the extension to networks, sort of arbitrary trading networks with bilateral contracts, transferable utility, and fully substitutable preferences. So before I go here, though, any more questions about you know, the world of many to one up through supply chain matching with contracts? Excellent. We're not sick of structure yet? We're uh, you're still pumped? I hear like chuckles. Maybe we're getting a little sick of structure. Um, OK, I promise. We're almost done. Arbitrary trading networks, bilateral contracts. So we're going to keep this bilateral trade structure. Transferable utility, this is the big change. So now we're going to allow transfers. And we're going to still insist on fully substitutable preferences. It's going to turn out that competitive equilibria exist and coincide with stable outcomes. So not only do we get sort of the existence of stable outcomes, which is what we saw before, but we're going to get this piece out of Kelso Crawford fully generalized that sort of stable, stability and competitive equilibrium are the same. And in fact, our existence proof is going to pass through Kelso and Crawford's existence proof in a kind of slick way. Uh, footnote, there's going to be, again, a maximal domain result. Full substitutability is necessary. And moreover, uh, you know, we're, and I won't have time to talk about this, but we can discuss it offline, all the correspondence results are going to extend to other solution concepts. So remember before, acyclicity was necessary for stability, but I already hinted that we, what we really want is for someone to pay somebody else a Pigouvian tax, basically. right? You know, F1 should pay F2, F2's loss from losing X1 in order to keep X2. And that's going to be the, the insight. You know, as soon as we allow people to transfer utility, now these sorts of deviations aren't going to be an issue. Very quickly, how does this link up to the rest of the literature? We've already seen Kelso Crawford, Ostrovsky, and uh, sorry, that should be Hatfield K, but Hatfield commoners. Um, we've built this up all through the matching literature, but I should point out that there's this huge literature also on exchange economies with indivisibilities. So in particular, you know. Shapley Schubick, this is the classical assignment problem, which Eric introduced. But much more recently, Golan Stichetti and Sun and Yang have been thinking about sort of economies with indivisible goods. And then agents enter these you know, exchange economies and are going to trade them around sort of like you might think about trading partners in a matching problem. And in fact, the trick is that the indivisible goods, those guys are going to be like doctors. And the traders are going to be hospitals who sort of like, we're going to try and allocate the goods to the hospitals that value them the most and where they use a version of Kelso and Crawford's technology. So just, you know, again, all of the world kind of looks like matching in my map. Um, you know, even things where there sort of isn't two-sided heterogeneity, you can also often use matching and theoretic ideas. You know, just like in, using, it, uh, using uh, auction theory and matching, you can use matching in these sorts of auctions as well. So just for the sake of closing the map, I want to point that out. Very quickly, so here's where the notation really changes. One more model. One model more. Another model of finite set of agents now. Um, set of agents, a set of bilateral trades. So trades here are now going to be the fundamental object. And they have an associated seller and an associated buyer. And an arrangement, this is going to be the object that contains sets of trades and prices for every trade. So like in competitive equilibrium analysis, we price everything, not just the trades that actually transact. Contracts, meanwhile, here's our x again, are just going to price the trades that transact. So each contract is going to be a pair trade price. And a feasible outcome is going to be a set of contracts that gives a unique price for every associated trade. So this looks a lot like the world we were working for, looking at before. These are just you know, trades. Those are our terms from before with 
an additional term that's a price. And we distinguish price specially because it's also related to competitive equilibrium where we price everything with just price vectors. Approximately happy? OK. Agents are going to have quasi-linear utility over cash. That's going to be important. So your utility for an arrangement is your some valuation for the associated set of trades. Again, we'll use subscript to mean restriction. Plus, the money you get, these are for objects, trades you sell. So I2, these are things that are going away from you, things you're selling, minus the prices you pay for trades 2i, trades that are being bought by you. So in our supply chain network, think about you know, here are the incoming trades, here are the outgoing trades. It's clear how to define this for outcomes as well. And then we'll use these utility functions to give us demand and choice correspondences. So again, this is going to look very much like classical GE or something of the sort, except for the fact that we have indivisible goods. The demand correspondence is just going to tell us which set of trades maximize our utility given prices. So you're always going to choose the best set of trades for you at those prices. And for any set of contracts, the choice is, again, just as before, going to be your favorite set of contracts. Okay. I'm not seeing as many nods as before. Are we, uh, did I do way too much notation way too quickly? I see a couple nods to that one. OK. Really quickly again then. Bilateral trades, these are the underlying objects, the goods that are being passed around. They have buyers and sellers. And there are sort of two ways we want to think about these things. We want to think about them as associated sort of price vectors over all trades. Those are going to be arrangements. This is like the, the, under, the fundamental object on which competitive equilibrium is built, based. And prices just for the trades that transact. Those are going to be like matching with contracts. You know, we sort of have a set of contracts we call our outcome where we price all the trades that say, like, you know, seller works with buyer. So a doctor might be the seller of a trade. The trade is, I work for you. And this is the price, the wage. OK? More nods this time. That's good. Quasi-linear utility over arrangements. So demand correspondence, choice correspondence, all of this is induced with the, you know, sort of the underlying primitive objects being preferences over trades, and then these prices in which you have quasi-linear utility. We make very simple assumptions on preferences. So assumption one. Um, you know, they are real numbers, possibly negative infinity. Number two, you have a finite outside option. So if you choose not to show up to the mechanism, no harm, no foul. Uh, number three, full substitutability, which is exactly the same as it was before. Preferences of a given agent are fully substitutable in choice language if same side contracts are substitutes and cross side contracts are complements. That's it, that's the uh, definition. Uh, there's a scary version of the definition, too, which I will switch or skip. Um, no, so on the slides, which will be posted on my website and so forth, you can see the formalization of this idea. I skipped the formalization before because the intuition is all you need to think about how this works in supply chain networks. There's some value to seeing the formalization here, in part because it deals with this issue of indifferences Eric raised at the beginning. But I think in the interest of time, we have the idea of substitutability. I'd much rather spend some time thinking about a third definition, which will be two slides hence. Next, uh, you know, next slide to uh, full of tons and tons of notation. This is the generalization of gross substitutes. So again, I'm putting this here so that you guys can see it. And I wouldn't try and meditate on it right now. But if you actually end up working with matching in networks, understanding that this is the same as gross substitutability, just done side by side. So here the idea is. P omega equals P omega prime for all omega, all trades you might sell, but prices of your inputs went up. P omega is greater than P omega prime. So the first half is sort of the input side gross substitutes, and the second half is uh, you know, the output side gross substitutes, and then we glue the cross side complementarity in the middle. But so this is also going to be sort of very much the same substitutability condition we had before. Is this the same as the uh, direct profit function being Yes, uh, two slides. <laughs> Um, uh, so, Paul, so Paul is already spotting that these are all going to be equivalent to the indirect utility function being uh, submodular. Uh, true. The last one is going to be indicator language. Um, and so here, this is perhaps, once you really grok it, 
uh, you know, absorb it. This might be the most intuitive. Uh, this says you're more willing to demand a given trade omega. So keep an object you could potentially sell or buy an object that you don't initially own if prices of other trades go up. So this actually incorporates both sides. This is same side substitutability and cross side complementarity all in one. So if prices of other inputs increase and or prices of possible outputs increase, you might uh, you know, keep an object, you might uh, buy an object that you didn't, uh, sorry, did I do that wrong? Prices of other trades. Sorry, I, miss, I looped it up. See, very intuitive. Um, you're more willing to demand omega, so you might uh, keep an object that you could potentially sell if the prices of your other inputs went up. Yes, there we go. Prices of your other inputs went up, so maybe now you can't buy what you need to make omega, and, the price of, or, your brother, and or your prices of your other outputs went up. So you want to sell something else. You'll use your inputs for some other purpose. And analogously, you, know, you might buy an object that you weren't going to buy before if the prices of your other inputs went up or the prices of your potential outputs go up. Everyone see that? That's what substitutability means in networks. All of these are equivalent. They're also equivalent to the indirect utility function being submodular. Um, and so this is going to sort of wrap together all the different conditions, both from this exchange economies with indivisibilities literature, matching with contracts. All of these different notions of substitutability are going to be the same. And so this is you know, the last, I think, re in the deck real slide on substitutability. But the real takeaway is that there are lots of different ways to think about substitutability. I recommend that you like, pick your favorite uh, and also sort of gain some flexibility with using the different ones in different cases, because it turns out that like, different conditions make different arguments easier. And so having a, a way to move around in your head between these different meanings can be really useful. OK, stability, just as it was before, competitive equilibrium now means that you, uh, you know, demand exactly your assigned set of trades given current prices. So this is the market, you know, market clearing, standard uh, individual rationality and market clearing. Beforehand, individual rationality and unblockedness equals stability. And these de this definition is exactly the same as the one we had before, just raised very slightly to deal with indifferences, just as Eric raised at the beginning. I'm going to spend, perfect, I'm going to spend about seven minutes telling you uh, about what the sort of structure of the world looks like once we get substitutable preferences. So first of all, a competitive equilibrium exists. How do we do this? First, we have to get rid of those pesky negative infinities I allowed us to have. So we transform potentially unbounded valuations to bounded valuations. That's fine. Um, and then we actually do this thing where we fold the market onto itself. So we construct a two-sided, one-to-many matching market. We're going to turn our big network into a Kelso-Crawford many-to-one market. How on earth do we do that? Sounds kind of weird, right? You know, sort of, I added all of this structure. I made this huge deal about how much I was generalizing. And now I'm going to claim that to prove our main theorem, we need to use like, this incredibly like, fundamental but like, totally many-to-one paper. Well. So let's turn all the agents into firms. And their valuations are going to be for the goods that they buy and the goods that they don't sell. So basically, your, your value is what you're, for what you're left holding at the end of the day. Workers are going to be all the trades. And they just want money. So think about this. It's like an auction. The, workers are going to sell, the trades are going to sell themselves to the uh, highest bidders. And they're only going to be willing to match with their associated firm. So they're either going to go to the buyer or the seller in the end. And the price P is going to be the wage in the Kelso-Crawford market. So it turns out, it's not totally obvious from what I've shown you here, but you can check that when I make this conversion, if the original valuation functions were substitutable, so are these sort of substitutable functions, or so are these valuation functions <coughs> over the sets of objects you're left with. Why is that? That's exactly because of this indicator language idea. You have substitutable preferences over goods. And that's what these are. These are the goods. So then a competitive equilibrium exists in the associated market. That's Kelso and Crawford's main theorem. And we fold it back into the original economy and find a competitive equilibrium in our real economy. Yes? If you minimize the sum of the, uh, of the submodular indirect profit functions, right? 
that gives you, doesn't that automatically give you a competitive equilibrium and prove that it's a lattice? So it definitely gives us lattice structure. Uh, we'll have to, so Paul's question is, can we do this all through submodular function minimization? Answer, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, well, let's discuss it offline. Um, we get, uh, but we do get right here, so one of the features is we do get lattice structure. So exactly the, uh, the indirect profit, the reason we use that submodularity result is exactly to show that there sort of is a lattice of competitive equilibrium price vectors for any uh, competitive equilibrium allocation. So it's quite possible there's a general existence argument along the lines Paul's describing. Uh, we also get welfare theorems. So competitive equilibrium allocations are efficient. And in fact, if I give you any efficient, you know, that's your first welfare theorem. Your second welfare theorem, if I give you any efficient set of trades, I can price it in competitive equilibrium. That second welfare theorem makes it make sense to talk about sort of a set of competitive equilibrium price vectors. And it turns out that uh, you know, those are a lattice. So we have sort of a lot of the sort of classical competitive equilibrium type results. Hmm? Yes? Um, so the question is, can you convexify and then get deterministic equilibria uh, substitutability. using substitutability? Yeah. And, and Paul's saying the answer is yes, so I'm going to trust that one. Well, the, the, yeah, but what's going to happen is you, you, you're going to get a linear program on the space where all the, all the extreme points of the constraints are integers. And mm -hmm. That's why you're going to, even though you're solving a, a, a convex program, you're going to get integer solutions. The structure of substitutes gives you that. Yeah, so... I don't know that anybody's ever written this sort of argument down exactly for these uh, generalized matching models, but I think it should work. I mean, you ha certainly have that structure in other parts of matching theory. Um, I wouldn't see any reason you couldn't do that here. Also a great question. Um, OK. I promised you the relationship between stability and competitive equilibrium. I also owe you an apology. I intentionally inserted slightly more slides to this deck than I intended to get through. We're running epsilon below my original planning time. but. The rest of this slide is also just here for like your perusal ex post. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you this example exists. I'm going to prove it to you by flashing it in front of you. And then if you really care, you can go read it afterwards. But it's incomplete if I don't show it. Uh, but before, what is the example going to be about? If we have a competitive equilibrium, then the associated outcome, so if I take you know, all the trades in Psi and give you their competitive equilibrium prices, the associated outcome is going to be stable. Without substitutability, great question. So Ken asks, any other conditions on this theorem? The answer is no. However, it's not the reverse implication actually relies on substitutability. So without substitutability structure, the reverse implication is not generally true. There exists a very simple example that essentially says you can't price the unpriced trades. Right? So if I give you a stable outcome, I'd like to know how to price the unpriced trades, but maybe peanut butter and jelly are complements. So the correct price for peanut butter depends on the price of jelly. And so this example is you know, one such that has that exact type, and you can't uh, guarantee a competitive equilibrium price vector. However, in the other direction, you can price stable outcomes in competitive equilibrium when preferences are fully substitutable. So sort of. Answering the, the, second, the implicit second half of Ken's question, if preferences are fully substitutable and A is a stable outcome, then now I can take the associated trades and price them in competitive equilibrium such that they're, you know, the actual trades that transact have the same prices. And what's the trick here? This is sort of a, a, it's a little bit wacky. Um, full substitutability implies that we can actually find a, a competitive equilibrium of an economy where we assume, so this is a really messy piece of math, a messy looking piece of math, but it's actually very simple. We assume you can take any of the contracts in the stable outcome you want. So if you wanted, you could throw them away. So you have sort of this bigger opportunity set to not just have your set A sub i, but any subset of A sub i you want. 
And it turns out, and then you take those with any trades that you didn't have before. So omega set minus the trades in A. You know, now this sort of weird economy is going to be the one where we're going to try and price the unpriced trades. This is ex or un unexecuted trades, also unpriced trades. This is the uh, set of trades that don't transact in the stable outcome. We find a competitive equilibrium, and we actually can find a competitive equilibrium where none of them transact. And that's where we use stability. So it turns out that if I give you sort of your favorite choices from the, uh, from the set A, remember stability lets you keep any contracts you had before. If there's not a competitive equilibrium in the new economy where there aren't any trades, then the original outcome couldn't have been stable. And those are going to be the associated prices we need. We're going to, that's going to complete our lifting. And so we get a competitive equilibrium price vector by sort of finding miraculously this competitive equilibrium in the economy where you have as much of A as you want. We find a competitive equilibrium where there's no trade at all. And so here we use substitutability very strongly because otherwise we wouldn't necessarily have a competitive equilibrium of this economy, much less one that's sort of well behaved. OK? I promised you a necessity result. If there exist at least four agents and the set of trades is exhaustive, this is basically technical conditions. Then if the preferences of some agent are not fully substitutable, there exists simple preference for all agents such that no stable outcome exists. Um, and so in particular, also, you know, we know that competitive equilibria give stable outcomes. So we also know that this substitutability condition is necessary for the existence of competitive equilibria. And so that sort of closes our model and wraps us back to where we were before. So we have you know, full substitutability, sort of many, many all equivalent definitions are exactly what you need for the guaranteed existence of stable outcomes and also what you need for stable outcomes and competitive equilibria to coincide. And so you know, full substitutability gets you existence of competitive equilibrium through a Kelso-Crawford uh, argument. And it's going to be what we need you know, for, uh, you know, for a coinci uh, coincidence of stability and competitive equilibrium, and in fact, many other solution concepts. So don't have time to go into it here, but we also get sort of equivalence of chain stability and something close to equivalence of the core. The core still isn't quite equal, but all the core allocations can be priced in competitive equilibrium. All right. So uh, quick discussion. Uh, Things that are sort of open and missing from this treatment that I've given you so far, um, you might think about applications of stability in the absence of competitive equilibrium. So I've just shown you that these things are the same under the conditions that guarantee that they both exist. But sometimes there are stable outcomes when there are no competitive equilibria. And so for applied work, you know, one way I like to think about this is sort of competitive equilibrium is a concept that's almost defined by how you find them. Maybe sometimes in applied papers, when we, you know, when we don't have competitive equilibria, and I'll tell you about one example in a second, we might actually like, you know, want to be using stability as the right concept. Uh, I actually have something on this slide that says, can we write this all down in terms of linear programming? So uh, you know, pre-posting Eric's earlier question a little bit, um, in some of the more specialized, where I say more specialized meaning still very, very general matching models, we have these really nice linear programming approaches to the existence of stable outcomes. I don't know that anybody's ever done that in sort of this full generality space. Um, empirical applications. So once we know about stability in supply chain networks, the world of supply chain starts looking a lot like the world of matching. And there have been recently you know, huge advances in the empirics of matching markets. As I mentioned on Monday, Attila Abdekadaroglu will talk about some of this. Nikhil Agarwal has been working on it. Um, love to understand if we can take some of those ideas into supply chain contexts. Um, and then, uh, you know, Deeply, sort of, you know, when I think about monotonicity conditions, it turns out that when you have divisible goods, concavity is the right condition, as opposed to substitutability. And so, understanding this linkage, why sort of substitutability is the maximal domain condition, and then this like slightly very similar, sort of, they do the same types of things, but they're not quite the same. And uh, you know, Paul, I see Paul sitting there shaking his head. You know, understanding sort of, you know, how, you know, why this linkage happens, whether there's some like underlying structural reason that concavity turns out to be the condition, uh, you know, is I think very hard and, and highly non-obvious to me at least. Um, I promised you a couple of minutes on applications, so here is your whirlwind. We've already seen from Paul, uh, you know, one of the biggest, and, and you know, I mentioned this like vein of gold at the beginning. Uh, 
you know, the fact that you can use sort of ideas from auction theory and matching theory, sort of, it's all the same general underlying structure, is just incredibly powerful, right? It means you can go and sort of look at a problem and not and sort of be completely agnostic ex ante about where your methods should come from in a lot of ways. Uh, and so, first thing, you know, just applications. You know, there's lots of things that were one of these things or the other, and suddenly, like now, we know they're applications of each other. Good. Uh, more specific on how matching with contracts has been used. So, Fuhiro Kojima and Yuchiro Kamada, other word, Yuchiro Kamada and Fuhiro Kojima have this paper where they think about the regional caps policy in the Japanese medical residency match. Um, the Japanese medical match imposed quotas. They limit the number of doctors in each region to try and you know, spread out and solve the rural hospitals problem. And it turns out that sort of understanding exactly what's going on and how you might redesign the, re the Japanese residency match to be more effective, uh, actually the underlying technology relies on matching with contracts. Uh, and so the first that I'm aware of application to be written down, it's got a 2014 date, but the first version of the paper circulated several years ago. The first like real world like matching theorists applying matching with contracts specifically to do, you know, to do design that I'm aware of was this Japanese medical match work. Um, then uh, Typhoon Sunmez and Tobias Fitzer uh, have these papers on matching of cadets to branches of the military. And here, this really interesting thing happens. So the military has these, what they call, branch of choice contracts, where you're allowed to bid additional years of service in exchange for advanced priority at a branch. But weirdly, the way they set up the priority structure, um, you don't get substitutable preferences over these contracts. So think about it. It's like an auction, right? You're going to bid additional years of service in exchange for advanced priority. It's just like an auction with a, with a discrete contract space. You get non-substitutable preferences, but unilaterally substitutable preferences. And so in this application, they're actually using not just sort of you know, matching with contracts, but matching with contracts without substitutability. So all that stuff I showed you at the beginning about these weakened substitutes conditions has actually come up in applications now. Um, you know, footnote, sort of all of these spaces I'm talking about, sort of everything here that's on, uh, on this slide, there are like many more things to do. So like, you know, most of these applications, you can sort of, I've listed all the papers that, ex that have been written in this space. And like, you know, you might think about things like, you know, how the army enters as a player. So we, I, we talked, uh, you know, there was this question earlier about how and, you know, what happens if you try and merge all the agents into a single agent? Well, here, you know, the army branches are modeled as one side of the market, but you might think that the army is the meta player. Um, and so, you know, they're trying to understand the army's objectives uh, might change how you think about the rest of the problem. OK, so uh, good. So I'm, I'm about one minute over, but let me give you one minute on each of these just very quickly. So generalized matching has had a lot to say about the design of affirmative action programs lately. Um, and this really, I should say, this echoes so an earlier paper of Fuhiro Kojima and then also work by Hafler, Yenmez, and Yildirim. It turns out sort of even past unilateral substitutability, uh, you can sometimes get stable outcomes in matching with contracts by using, uh, in this case, what uh, Typhoon and I called matching with slot-specific priorities, which is sort of a, a generalization of this idea I showed you two days ago where you have sort of a bunch of different slots at a school. You might actually want to give them all different priority or preference relations. And it turns out you can handle that too so long as you have a rule about how you order the slots when you fill them. Uh, and this, you know, both... You know, we have sort of a theory paper about this, but it also came up very recently in the, uh, in the redesign of the Boston Public School match. They did a lot of different things, but one of the, uh, you know, one of the changes they made um, was in reaction to results that we found that the way they had imposed the ordering of these slots was actually rendering their mechanism not as favorable to Walkstone students as they might have wanted in a way that was non-transparent. Um, you know, footnote there, again, sort of lots of work going on in this. Uh, I should give you know, a shout out to uh, Itai and Parag student Peng Shi, who's been like, very, very central in this redesign. They've got tons and tons of things they're doing. And it's a very, uh, I don't know, living area, I guess. You know, it's sort of all of these very subtle things that come out once you realize the, the underlying design details might take you beyond the scope of just sort of general Gail Shapley or something like that. Um, Last thing, so I mentioned stable outcomes when there are no competitive equilibria. Well, when's a classical example in economics when we don't have competitive equilibria? How about price restrictions? The price should be below the price floor, but it can't get there. So John has this very nice paper with uh, Charlie Plott and Tomomi Tanaka that shows 
And in these sorts of worlds, the set of stable outcomes behave exactly as you'd want them to behave. So when you hit the floor, that's the stable outcome. You know, if the price wants to be below the floor, the stable outcome prices exactly at the floor. And you can actually get quality competition and get sort of nice, sharp, comparative static results in terms of you know, quality or other characteristics of goods um, in, by taking comparative statics of the set of stable outcomes. And so again, sort of, this is the first application I'm aware of where people are using these like, you know, matching models without, uh, you know, matching models with transfers and lots of structure, but without competitive equilibria to say something about the world. Al, yes? Quick comment to put this in context with the rest of the week. Uh, today we took contracts as primitive, but of course contracts are artifacts, they're things that people make. And so there's also contract design. And I think maybe Paul tomorrow when he talks about the incentive auction yep. will touch a little bit on the fact that when you design a market, one of the things you might design is what the contracts are that are being sold in that market. And a little bit Scott talked about that when he says, how about the contract where you just get paid but don't work? You might not want that contract. Uh, let me it's amplify that. It depends which you. <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, let me amplify what Al just said, partially because I determined that the videos don't record all of the extra commentary. That was a super, super important comment. So Al points out, today, all day, the contracts have been the primitives, right? Except for that little bit where I talked about sort of bundling and unbundling contracts, everywhere else I've been proving theorems given the contract structure. And in fact, lots of times as market designers, we are tasked with figuring out the contract structure often in response to very unclear opinions about what the, the policymakers want. So one of the things that happened, say, in this Boston redesign is the policymakers had a very good sense of what they wanted, but it didn't map directly, at least with what we knew at the time, into priority structures in the language that we already knew how to talk about. And so a lot of the like, really subtle work that's being done in this redesign now is to sort of build priority structures and, and individual specific menus. I, I footnoted Peng. I will, I will give him a, a, an even louder shout out here to figure out sort of how to implement priorities and menus for students, there's menus for students over schools that best implement the policy goals of the Boston public school system. And so another thing you can do, and here there's like lots of gains from trade with OR and computer science as well, you know, one of the things you can do is use you know, the contract design stage <coughs> as a key component of the market design to, impose, you know, to implement the policy goals more effectively. QED.